who is Beelzebub? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 11. We start off with Luke describing the Lord's Prayer. The disciples went to Jesus and said, John's disciples were taught how to pray by John. You, Lord, teach us to pray. So he gives us the Lord's Prayer. We can look that up. Again, we're reading along. And this is one of the most fundamental things. My church says it every Sunday. Lots of churches do. I've even met Jewish people who say the Lord's Prayer, finding it as a very good prayer to God. And at the time Jesus was asked for this, he was praying. Again, Luke likes to highlight the fact that Jesus spent time alone and praying to God, a very important thing. And out of all the questions I think that I've heard the disciples ask Jesus, this one has to be, I think, the best. I find it heartwarming that they want to know, we see you doing this. You're leading us by example. How should we be praying? We won't go into the Lord's Prayer in great detail, primarily because we've done it in other Gospels. But some points to make note of every time I read something new in a new commentary I read for a particular book. The one that stood out in this one was talking about when it asks not to be led in temptation. Is Jesus leading us into temptation? No. What we're asking is God protect us from temptation. Let us not be led into temptation. And God promises that he's not going to lead us to temptation that we cannot escape from or handle, that there will always be an escape from it. So temptation is a part of all of our lives, including Jesus, but it's something that we're going to have ways of getting away from if we get into that situation. And still, I believe, too, I guess the timing in Luke is a little bit different than it is in Matthew. There were over 1,200 days in Jesus' ministry. We don't hear about every single one of them. And so my vibe in all of this, when it comes to timing or When this happened, before this happened, the apostles are certainly ordering things to make their narrative, to tell the story they're trying to tell. But I also believe that he said the Lord's Prayer more than once. Of course he did. If you weren't there on that day, did you miss the whole thing? No, he said it lots of times. Why I think it's not even the same event is the wording's a little bit different. Some of the words are a little bit in other order. But Matthew says, give us our daily bread this day. But in Luke, it says, give it to us day by day. So different words in Greek. Give it to us each day. It reminds me of the manna that the Israelis got in the desert every day, their daily bread. In Matthew, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive. Here it says, forgive us our sins. Then gives everyone the idea that when we talk about sins, it's our debt towards God. We are incurring a debt. We're incurring a burden that has to be relieved from us. And that's where that idea of Jesus having the ultimate jubilee, where we are released from our debts. That's the jubilee where all debtors are forgiven their debts. In this case, our debts are our sins. And we are about to have the greatest jubilee of all, where Jesus is going to forgive all of our sins slash debts. Not the financial ones, the sin debts. The very end of the Lord's Prayer is removed entirely in Luke's. He's just keeping to the business in this particular instance. Again, I believe that Jesus, when he talked to individuals, like I said, when he says to Matthew, follow me, he knew what Matthew was going to do. But when he tells the guy, the fox has his home, but I don't even have a home, he knew that guy was going to walk away. In this case, I think every time he tells a similar story, a similar parable, he uses a little bit different phrase, he says it a little bit different way. He knows the hearts of his listeners and he knows what they needed to hear. The important point is that this is what they call communal prayer. Because again, the Lord's Prayer is our Father. It's give us. He gives a kind of interesting parable about a friend. So you go to a friend at midnight and say, hey, I need three loaves of bread. And guy's like, hey, my kids are asleep. We're all sleeping. I'm I'm not going to give you three loaves of bread because, you know, it's super late. We're not doing that. But not because of friendship, but because of persistence. This friend of yours is going to give you the bread. Persistence pays off. And so this is where Jesus goes in to ask and it'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For whoever asks will receive and whoever seeks will find. And whoever knocks, it will be open. And then the second part of it is what kind of father would give 
his kid a scorpion when he wants an egg. That a heavenly father knows exactly what you need. This is tying right into the prayer. When we pray to God, he is not answering us as a video game and giving us exactly what we want. He's not a genie in a bottle giving us our three wishes. He is giving us a gift that a father would give you. You ever been a kid and you've asked for something ridiculous, something dangerous? Not going to get that. He's going to get you what you need. But Jesus is telling us to reach out to him, even if we feel it's too late, even if we feel that it's a burden or a normal human being would find it a burden. Jesus is there as that good father giving his children the proper gifts. Should I pray persistently? Should I pray over and over again or just once? God heard me the first time, right? But the fact is, is that when we pray over and over again for something, the change happens inside of us. Maybe this time we're listening and the other times we're not listening. Now it says in ESV, Jesus and Beelzebub. Who is Beelzebub? This is kind of an interesting thing. We're going to talk about that. So it says that he was casting out a demon that was coming from a mute man. And when the demon was gone, people marveled again. That's amazing. He casts out demons. And then other people say, oh, he's just doing this as part of being the devil. Well, how is the devil casting out the devil? You're not going to be on that same side. It doesn't even make sense. And so Jesus is like, this doesn't make sense at all because a kingdom divided against itself or a household against itself falls. Satan wouldn't be casting out himself, wouldn't be casting out his own demons by Beelzebub. It doesn't even make sense the things that you are saying. Instead, by the finger of God, he is casting out these demons. And says that phrase again, whoever is not with me is against me. Before we heard, if he is not against me, he is with me. Both ways. (laughs) And whoever does not gather, meaning collecting my harvest, scatters. So Beelzebub is kind of an interesting term. There's many different words for Satan in general. You know, we have the devil, there's Satan, people call him the advocate, the liar. There's many terms that are used for the devil. This one comes from Baal Zebub, which was the Philistine idol god. And Baal used to be a name for God, our father. It was an original name, but it means like on high, uh, up there. And then pagan surrounding tribes took it on and started calling Baal, Zebub, other types of Baal. And it no longer referred to God the Father. There are just places in the Old Testament that will say Baal. Now we're saying this is full out the devil. And it actually translates to something like Lord of the Flies. And what happens with flies? Carcasses. That's where flies are. I think even poop (laughs) is where flies are. This is a terrible term, but it is the Lord of the flies. If the devil is strong, the devil can drag us away or lead us away, send demons in his name. There's a lot of things he can't do. And Jesus is always going to be more powerful than the devil. He is able to pull the devil out of people, demons out of people. He is able with a finger of God to remove it. And I think that finger of God makes me think of, this is light work. I can just remove this at will. So he drives out demons as much as he must. Every time he comes across a person who has one, he takes the devil, the demon out of this person. Makes me think, I don't even need my full arm. I don't need my whole body. I don't need a legion of my own angels to do this. Just my little finger. Out you go. Then he gives the parable and it's more of a like a lesson that an unclean spirit had gone out of a person and passes through the waterless place. And when it comes to this house, it found the house empty, comes in and brings in seven other spirits, more evil, it says, than the first one. And they all just live there. And then the state of the person is worse than when they found it. It makes me think of, we have to be filled with God's presence. If you empty yourself, you know, there's some meditation practices where you're trying to empty yourself of thought, empty yourself of something. But even so, sometimes we're just trying to get rid of, "Ah, I'm just done with God. I'm just done with Jesus. 
and I'm just getting rid of this in my heart. When there's nothing there, what comes? A demon. And what does the demon bring? More demons. And again, the last being worse than the first. You cannot be emptied of a thing. You have to keep filling yourself with God. And that's why the Christian form of meditation is a little bit different. It is about soaking in God, filling yourself with God, filling yourself with God's word. If there is just so much God's word filled in you, there's no more room for devils, right? There's no room for demons in there. God is telling us, don't go into that neutral emptiness, that when we have nothing there, it will get filled. We should keep God in there to make sure we are filled with God's message. Woman raised her voice and praised Mary. Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that you nursed at. And Jesus said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It's not Mary just who is blessed. She is, of course, blessed because she heard the word of Jesus. If you keep the word of God, you are blessed too. This is not about position. This is not about being in his direct family or not in his direct family. I remember, you know, reading one of those books, I forgot what it was, like even Dan Brown or something like that. And you're trying to track this, I have lineage to Jesus' family. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Everybody is part of God's family who hears his word and keeps it. Lineage doesn't matter. Gives the sign of Jonah. We've heard this in other gospels. I think it was in Matthew where he says that there is no sign for this generation. So evil, I'm not even gave you a sign except for the sign of Jonah. Jonah went to the place of Nineveh. He did not want to go. Jesus is going to go and wants to go and brought those people to redemption. But gives the other example, the queen of the south, that's Queen Sheba, who went to Solomon, who was great at his time. Wisdom of Solomon was a gift from God and learned from him. And the men of Nineveh learned from Jonah. Even if all those people learned the lesson from the people who were representing God, someone better than Jonah and someone better than Solomon right here with you now, meaning you should listen because this is important. And the other part that was more described in Matthew was the fact that Jonah was in the whale, disappeared under the water for three days and came back and preached. Something's going to happen to Jesus where he's going to be gone for three days. And then my favorite parable. Do I say that every week that this is my favorite parable? Well, this is my favorite parable that no one has a light and puts it in the cellar under a basket, but instead you just put it up someplace high on a stand, it says, and let it shine. Also, your eyes are the lamp of your body. Meaning whatever you let in, if you let in light and joy and Jesus, then it's going to be filled with light. It is the window of our soul, I think someone said. But when it's bad and it's darkness, if you look on evil things, if you see bad things with your eyes, it's going to fill your body with darkness too. So if you want to have your body full of light, you want your body to be following what your heart is telling you, then soak in everything that is light, which is going to be everything that is Jesus, and let it all shine out like a lamp when the rays give you the light. I heard today, I think I was listening to Adam Curry talking about his Christian faith. He was a actually the first podcaster in the world. And he said that his pastor told him, you're a leaky basket. Make sure that you fill yourself up with the light of God and it leaks out everywhere you go. And that he prays for that. And that's what it makes me think about this light thinking is exactly it. We should get filled with the light and then we will light up too. It is harder work to hide a light than it is to actually just let it shine. This is part of letting the light come out of you, but also not letting the darkness enter you. Instead, keep filling yourself with the light, just like the empty house with a demon. Don't be empty. Be full of the light of Jesus. Jesus, again, talks about the woe to the Pharisees and the lawyers. The lawyers are going to be the law of God and people who could argue and look at the law of God and determine whether you're breaking it. We've talked about the Sanhedrin the 72 judges and the fact that there was a defense lawyer and a prosecution lawyer. So lawyers existed and it was mostly the law of God. So Jesus was lounging and dining with Pharisees. 
And this is the part where he said, you didn't wash. You know, you didn't clean your paws, right? You didn't do the ritual bathing. It's more than just cleaning your paws, but this ritual bathing that goes on. And Jesus says, you know, you are so worried about the outside, the cup and the dish and the hands, and whether you did this washing, and yet you are non-concerned about everything that goes on the inside of you, but you're full of greed and wickedness. You don't give alms to people, but you're all worried about being clean. And woe to you, it says, who tithe mint and every herb and then ignore completely the injustice of the world, the love of God, it says. You have, you know, the things that you should be doing, you're not doing for other people. That you love the best seat in the house. You love everyone saying, hey, look at you. I'm so honored to be in your presence. And instead, it says at the end, woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. You think you're all fancy and you think you're putting on this good show, but you instead are a grave, dead bones, nothing that can produce life. You know, it's funny because in a sense, the Sanhedrin, you know, they didn't believe in anything outside the law, the first five books of the Moses. And it's weird to me because there's a story in there about how we come about, how Israel comes about, the nation came about, the laws and all the rules. I think there were like 600 rules and, you know, there were lots of do's and lots of don'ts in the first five books of the Torah. But there's not hope. There's no way out. That's why the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees just didn't even believe in heaven, in redemption, in going to heaven. I mean, it just didn't cross their minds. And it reminds me a lot of Christians, too, who decide the Bible's not true, that we're just going to do all the things where God tells us to be ethical or be good to the poor, all great things, but they ignore every other part of it. The Pharisees are interesting to me because they're trying. They believe that they're doing the right thing. They think that they are following God, that they made all these rules so they wouldn't possibly not follow God. You know, that's why you put rules upon rules. I always thought about it in a sense where I tried to tell, I used to be a team lead, and I would tell my team, quit screwing around, you know, quit making mistakes and abusing things because there's going to be a rule made and then you're going to be unhappy with it. This is what happens over all the course of these millennia of Jewish thought, of God saying, this is what I want from you. They miss the compassion part and they're all about the rules and they're going to create more and more rules just to ensure you don't break any rules. But what's interesting to me about them is they're trying to follow God's rules. They just are completely off track with it. They're not looking at the love that God says. I was watching some videos on YouTube of there's a fellow named Alan Parr, who I like quite a bit on YouTube when he talks about God and some of the passages and what they mean. And people will take all the bad parts out and say, see, not a loving God. Instead of looking at the actual text, which talks about the compassion, the caring, the caring for each other. They don't want to see that. They want to see the bad things and take them out of context so that they don't know what it means. Again, they're trying not to hear. They're trying not to see and they're trying not to understand. And that was a mistake of the Pharisees. To me, they are so close to it. And yet they keep, I don't know, falling apart on it. And so he is saying at this point, you know, you care about this tithing, about cleaning the plates, about washing your paws, and you don't care about the poor people. You don't care about the people who need your help. This has gone wrong all the way. Then the lawyer comes back to him and saying, hey, you are insulting us also by saying these things, the lawyers. And he goes, well, what do you lawyers do? <laughs> you all load your people with burdens that are hard to bear and you yourselves don't touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So you make it hard for everyone to follow the rules. And yet you won't even follow those rules. You have built the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you, you're, you're just like the people who killed all the prophets of old. You witnessed the deeds and then killed them for it. And then you build them their tombs. Oh, we really honor this prophet. He was so great, but you're the ones who killed them. And so therefore it says the wisdom of God said, personification, I will send them prophets and apostles. And apostles will be, you know, like a, 
a messenger, an, a, an ambassador, and they will be killed and persecuted. And the blood of the prophets will be shed from the foundations of the world, the beginning of time. And they will be charged against this generation. The blood of Abel, the blood of Zechariah, all who perish because of your lawyering, not just you, but your ancestors lawyering. You're going to hear it. And so woe to you lawyers too, because you've taken away knowledge from people. And you're not trying to stop yourself from going to heaven or going to the, the close relationship with God. You're just trying to keep everyone else out, but you're still going there. That's you know kind of the point in some cases of lawyers, right? That you look at the law and say, whether this person did a good thing or a bad thing, oh, here's a loophole. And that's what I think he's saying to them. You're finding these loopholes. You're not making yourself subjected to the law because you think you found some way out. But instead, this kind of thinking killed the prophets. And that kind of fire ends Luke 11. What I'm going to meditate on this week is that idea about how we come up with catches to catch other people. And yet we try to keep ourselves from being caught in those. I remember someone commenting on kind of sin in society. And then I said, but isn't this sin almost the same sin as that sin? Well, he didn't like that much. We try to find ways for, our way, for ourselves or for the people we love or the people think the way we think to get out of certain rules of God. Well, that doesn't count towards me because of X, Y, and Z. But to other people, we're very quick to convict them. Can we have a better look at law? I think that's what the, how the chapter starts out in the Lord's Prayer, that we're going to forgive as we hope to be forgiven. We are going to hope that God's kingdom comes and our sins are forgiven. And I think that's where we started out at the beginning today with the Lord's Prayer, that we want to forgive others as we've been forgiven, that we want to relieve debts as we hope our debts are to be relieved. And what I'm going to pray about is that I don't look at other people with a prosecutor or a lawyer's eyes, but instead with the eyes of light and love and what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to give people mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And I'm going to pray that I have more mercy, forgiveness, and grace for the people who are not like me and understand that God loves them the same way he loves me. And what I'm going to share is the fact that good is stronger than evil, that God has the ability to vanquish demons, to fight Satan with his finger. He is all-powerful, while Satan, his demons, are very, very limited. When we have Jesus on our side, we know that he can protect us with his finger. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember that you can check out this website, thebibleinsmallsteps.com, if you're interested in the blog article, letting people hear this podcast without having a podcast listener. Each podcast is actually playable on the website. So if you know someone who would love to hear this podcast but doesn't know the foggiest idea of how to get a podcast to work, they can just listen to it on the website. 